Welcome to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast, brought to you by Proudmouth. Being your own loud is not new to marketing, but the mindset, strategies, and resources to help get you there are evolving faster than this industry is keeping up. It's time to find a new perspective on what works, why, and how to move your business forward. Listen in as Matt Halloran interviews guest experts to help you be your own loud. Hello and welcome to another Top Advisor Marketing Podcast. It's been many, many episodes, more than I would like to count. And and the only person we've ever had on the show who talked about a marketing plan was my partner, Kirk Lowe. And I have the honor of interviewing somebody who specializes in marketing plans. Her name is Claire Aiken. She's the founder of Indigo Marketing Agency. I'm telling you right now that you all need to look her up. She's consistently sharing content that's magnificent, and she does what most of you don't do, which is to teach you actually how to plan. And in financial services, most of you are planners, <laughs> you don't have a marketing plan, uh, which is frustrating and, and, and mo- moderately funny. But uh, Claire, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having me. I know that the two things that financial services professionals and experts in general don't do well is plan or have any sort of foresight whatsoever, right? They're they're just so in the moment. I mean, they do that planning for their clients, but they just don't seem to do it for themselves. Why do you think that is? Right, and I think it's so funny. It's like the, you know, the shoemaker's kids have no shoes. Advisors tell their clients to get help with something as complex as financial planning, but then they struggle to do the same thing when it comes to websites or SEO or marketing. And where you're telling your clients to reach out to an expert and outsource something as important as financial planning, you should do the same thing with your marketing. And so that's what I do is I help independent financial advisors to outsource their marketing so that it gets done on a consistent basis and it represents them well. Because like you mentioned, that there's consistency is really challenging for advisors. So it's kind of this feast or famine cycle. As they get busy, they forget to do their marketing and then their leads dry up and then they start their marketing again and then they abandon it. But you want to be doing it every single month on a regular basis. You want to have a 12 month marketing plan and make sure that you're putting the fuel into the engine of your business. Well, let's talk about the fuel because you're, I mean, two things that you said there that I love and I'm going to, is number one, when, as a consultant, one of the things that, that was an epiphany and one of the reasons why Kirk and I started Proudmouth or what it used to be top advisor marketing was advisors just got so tired of us telling them what to do. They wanted somebody to do it for them, right? Which is luckily why you ha- have this amazing business and, and we have a, a job here uh, at Proudmouth now because there's so many advisors who really do want to be able to do what you say, but they still have to do the planning. So why do you think marketing is is kind of like the, 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 the hairy stepchild of the business world? I just, I don't understand that. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons for that. So first of all, marketing has gotten more and more complex over the last 10 to 15 years, where it used to be pretty straightforward. There's so much technical knowledge that's involved now. So not only do you have to think like a marketer, which is pretty different than the thought process of financial planning and investment management, but also you have to understand the technical systems of search engine optimization, websites, email marketing, social media, a lot of these things that advisors just don't have the time to learn, nor should they invest their time and energy in learning these systems. I have found that experts in general seem to think, well, heck, Claire, I'm an expert in this, so therefore my expertise should permeate through other areas. But you know as well as I do that that that's really not the case. What is the number one thing that after somebody engages you that the advisors feel? So I want to kind of talk about feeling here because we're going to talk about the logistics, but I want to get to the core of why you have such a successful career and why people working with you continue to work with you. How do you make them feel? I think that's a great question. And that's a question that advisors should be thinking about their clients as well. The goal of my organization is to minimize the time that advisors have to spend on their marketing. So they're getting a completely custom marketing presence and they feel relief, I think is the core emotion that most advisors feel when they work with us because marketing can be so overwhelming. Should you be doing radio ads, podcasts, TV shows, blog posts, webinars, what should you be doing? And once we simplify it, we say, look, we've been doing this for seven years and we've distilled down 
everything advisors should be doing from a marketing perspective to get the most bang for their buck and we will do it for you. That's the point that advisors feel like they're doing what they should be doing and it's a minimum investment of their time. They pay, you know, pay us or write a check each month, spend a half hour on their marketing, reviewing what we put out for them, and they can focus on the other more important areas of their business. So it's a half an hour. I mean, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I mean, is that the average amount of time that when somebody engages you that they need to still focus per month? Yep. So our setup process requires about four hours of the advisor's time to get set up to help us with our discovery call, to help us understand who they serve, how they help, the most urgent problems that they're solving for their clients. But on an ongoing basis, it's our goal to ask them to spend one half hour or less per month reviewing the content that we've written for them so that we can deploy it. We make any compliance changes. We upload it to their site. We do all of the heavy lifting, getting it out on social media. And so we know they're busy. We know they don't probably enjoy marketing. We just need their approval on the content and then we're off to the races. So you got us beat hands down there, Claire. <laughs> I just wanted to say that because uh, it is definitely more time for for what we do. Uh, we we say it's about three hours on average that an advisor would spend with us to to utilize our content creation. So everybody, if you think a half an hour, which is awesome, is is something you can use that half an hour of your time to really create this custom marketing, then you need to hire Claire because her team will do absolutely everything else. And and what a minimal investment for such maximum impact, which leads me to that question. What, what impact do you see? So, so somebody's going from when, you know, some of them have nothing and then they come to you and they're like, help me. Let's talk about some of the outcome based things that we see when people engage you and, and also give us an idea on how long it takes for somebody to start seeing an impact for this custom marketing. A lot of people will make marketing seem like this artful, nebulous concept that you couldn't possibly measure. And that's not true. With everything in life, you should measure the results, especially for something if you're making a big investment in it. We look for leading and lagging indicators of success. And so the leading indicators of success are more traffic to your website, more email opens, more awareness of what you do. And then the lagging indicators of success are maybe three to six months down the road where you're getting more referrals, more new appointments on your calendar and more clients you know, moving their money and signing new account paperwork. Everything is measurable. We send our marketing scorecard each month that measures things like traffic to your website, social media activity, engagement, um, search engine optimization results. You should keep an eye on that each month, make sure the numbers are going in the right direction and make sure that you're getting more referrals and that your network is able to refer you when they come across somebody who needs your help. So what happens, this just recently happened with one of our clients, their 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 podcast statistics and their social media statistics were, were actually going up and they were going up quite nicely. And then they took a big dip. The advisor came back to us and said, you know, what the heck's going on? And so we talked to them about it. What do you see as the main issue that there are ebbs and flows in this content marketing game that we're both in? Every time when I look at marketing metrics for our advisors and there's a dip, the reason is that they didn't approve their content that didn't go out on time. So ah. to the extent that, you know, to the extent that they stay on task, they approve their content, we get their content out every single month, their numbers stay at a stable level and are increasing over time. And so I, I tell advisors who get distracted or want to, you know, look at the latest marketing strategies. There are two things that they really need to focus on. One is adding people to their email list. So every person that you know, personally, every client, every prospect, every referral partner, everybody, you know, needs to be on your email list and you need to be adding people each and every month. And the second idea that they need to focus on is content. Get your content out on time and make it as good as possible. So we're talking about creating content that really resonates with your audience. What are the questions that your clients are asking you? What are their concerns? What is keeping them up at night? What are your prospects typing into Google? These are the questions we want to answer through your content marketing so that your content is relevant and valuable. Everybody who's listening to this podcast are going to get a couple of samples that, that you've provided for us. One of them is a is a sample marketing plan or calendar, which, by the way, is is 
wonderful and repeatable. So, I, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend any time because people can just download that clear. But I do want to spend a little bit of time on this marketing strategy checklist. We know that our clients, our mutual clients in financial services, love checklists because they love systems. They love all of the sort of tracking. Where do you even begin? So through your four hour discovery process, I'm assuming that you're going through some of this strategy checklist to at least see how they're answering these. Number one, where did the checklist come from? And then number two is, do you mind if we dive into it a little bit? Absolutely. Sure. The Checklist Manifesto is one of my favorite books, and I love the process of using checklists to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. We created this checklist because the thing that happens is advisors come to us and they are overwhelmed with all the possibilities out there from a marketing perspective. And it's hard to explain to them how they measure up. What are top advisors like Ken Fisher doing that you're not doing? And why is his marketing more successful than yours? So we broke it down into 18 points of what top advisors are doing. So you can score yourself and check off each box that you're doing and understand what's missing and what are the most important next steps that you should take to make an impact on your marketing. Some of these things on here, especially when it comes to with just some of the categories that we're going to go through, I'm quite surprised that you ask some of these questions. So, so let's start at the top. So the beginning is technical stuff. Walk us through what sort of technical stuff that you want to make sure the advisors have on this marketing strategy checklist. Some of the most important foundations of your marketing is they have to meet a minimum standard. You have to have a website that works well, that's secure, that's mobile responsive, that looks great on any device, that's optimized for search engines. That is just critical because we know that even if somebody is referred to you by somebody they trust, the first thing they're going to do is type your name into Google or your firm name and find your website. If you don't look good or if they can't find your site, that's a huge problem. We need to meet some of these foundational technical specifications. Can they go to your site and schedule an appointment online 24-7? It does your site look good on a mobile device? Some of these basic things. Well, and I guess I'm just really surprised, Claire, that there are even websites out there that aren't mobile mobile friendly at all. I mean, the, so many people just do their stuff on their phones or their tablets nowadays. And I've gone to financial advisors websites and I have to like zoom in to read anything and then it's all messed up and I can't there's no drop downs. And, and again, I can't. Here's my biggest frustration is I hate it when I can't find their phone number. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so it's so important that at the outset, we do things like set up your Google My Business profile so that when someone searches for you, they can click to call or they can click to get directions to your office. And we see this data each and every month for our advisors that hundreds of people are looking at their business on Google My Business and either getting directions, clicking to go to the website, clicking to call the office. So this isn't just a prospecting issue. It's a client service issue as clients need to be able to get a hold of you really quickly and easily. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about the website itself because in you, your first checkbox here is, does your website clearly articulate one urgent problem you solve for a specific group? Which means everybody who's been listening to this podcast for the last 200 and some odd episodes that once again, another marketing person is talking to you about focus your marketing so that you can communicate directly. Let's go through some of the other stuff that you do with the website to make sure that their ducks are in a row. Yeah, so there's a lot of really kind of obvious things that advisors should be adding to their website that most of the people who come to us do not have. The first thing is their story. So this is such a trust-based business. People want to know, like, and trust the advisor that they're going to be working with. So the first piece of content we create for all of our clients is why I became a financial advisor. It's always the top performing post. It talks about your story, your passion, why you do what you do and why you care. So that's one item to definitely add to your website. Another is a video, if you can, a video of you telling your story. Another that's very obvious to me, but I rarely see it is a sample financial plan. People want to understand what they're buying. You know, you want to test drive a car. You want to see what you're buying. And if you add a sample financial plan to your site, and it doesn't have to be long, just a one pager, this is one of the top most visited pages on your website. Another thing would be a link to schedule a call. Just some of these basic ideas, stories of the types of clients you serve. Stories do really well. People want to understand what are the types of clients that you work with and what are the benefits that you provide them? You know, did you help a couple to retire on time and sail around the world? Or did you help a business owner to sell his business and retire and spend time with his family? Stories with photos are what people want to consume on your site. Another thing that I encourage all advisors to add is 
their pricing and services. People are going to find out how much you charge to manage their money. And so put it out there because it's a great way to overcome that objection just at the outset. And it's a page that gets tons of clicks that people want to just overcome and understand that before they move on to making a decision to work with you. Every one of those that you just said, Claire, I could totally like, yep, that makes a lot of sense. I'm assuming you get some resistance on that last one. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I'm actually working on a video right now of why you need pricing and services on your website, because the average advisory fee is higher than you would think. I have a chart on my website that shows the average advisory fee per account uh, level. So how, you know, a dollar amount and the advisory fee that is typically charged. And I'll tell you that almost all of my clients are lower than that fee because they're competing with some of the huge institutions that charge more in fees. If you can come in lower than the average fee and explain the value that people get from paying that fee, which is typically comprehensive financial planning and investment management, then you're showing a huge value at a great uh, price point. And so I recommend just being really upfront with the pricing that you charge. I know there's some reasons that advisors are reticent to do that, but I coach them to at least consider doing that. Well, thank you for doing that, Claire. I, I think that that is, that is a, a torch that I'm so happy other people are carrying because you're right, they are going to find out. And by being upfront and honest about some of the more controversial, I'm air quoting there, things within our industry just separates you that much more from the schmuck down the street who's very cryptic and weird about how they're compensated. Now, the website itself, one of the things that has happened often is the, these pop-up things, right? Would you like to subscribe to our newsletter? What do you, what do you think about that sort of stuff? I'm not a fan of pop-ups and I'm not a fan of lead magnets either. I think the time has uh, come and gone for those things. People want information for free. They don't want to enter their email address. So what I coach advisors to do and what we do on behalf of our advisors is create really great, valuable content where we give away 90% of what the advisor knows. And then we ask the prospect to take the next step to start the conversation. And so it could be a free phone call where they can ask questions about their specific circumstances, or it could be ask a question on your website. Um, and so allowing them to consume this information and take the appropriate next step wherever they're ready to move forward is kind of the best way to start these conversations and start engaging people. So one of the metrics that you said right at the beginning was to make sure that their email list is growing, that their social media following is growing, but you're not really opening up huge doors for the email. Are you still getting that sort of 90%? I mean, so we we firmly agree 100% with you, you know, give 90% away or more and then ask where there's something that they're like, okay, yep, you've already given me enough. I, I feel the it's actually the principle of reciprocity, right? You've given me so much, so therefore I'll give you this little bit of information. So how do you get people's email addresses if it's not something that's a pop-up or something a form on the website? Right. And I think you hit the nail on the head. It feels so transactional to have to put in your email address to get some kind of content. So the way that we grow our advisors email list is through webinars. And so we create webinars that are on their site. It feels like a live webinar, though it is recorded. And there's several reasons we do that. And the person who's wanting to watch the webinar puts in their email address to sign up for a specific time. So the reason they're entering their email address is so they can get the email and the countdown and the link to watch the webinar so it doesn't feel as transactional. They're added to your email list and they get a series of follow-up emails encouraging them to schedule a call with you. Do you help the advisors come up with the topics for their webinars? Our webinar process includes choosing a topic and the topic is the most important part of your webinar because the conversion of people signing up only depends on the topic and the description. So the way that we help advisors choose a topic is not only through thinking about their ideal prospects and what is most important to them, but we also do things like looking at your existing content, the pages on your website, the articles that you've sent out before, what is the top performing content that you have? And could we put that into a webinar format? That's brilliant. I absolutely love because that's demand, right? We see demand. So if somebody's interacting with somebody or something on your site or, or whatever, then we know that people are wanting that information. And if we can give them that extra information, then they're just going to be that much happier. And again, more interested in communicating with you. I should have said this before. You've got technical stuff, website, communication, social media, video, and metrics on this, this checklist that we're going to be providing for all of our listeners. And in communication, you talk about proactively asking for referrals 
at least twice per year, twice per year, Claire. Talk to me about that. Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons that it is so important to have somebody else do your marketing. In fact, I even have my team do my marketing for me because it's awkward to ask for referrals and it's awkward to write about yourself often. And so by outsourcing it, you can have a company like ours ask for introductions and referrals in a tactful way. So the way that we help advisors to ask for referrals is by sending out content at least twice a year that says, do you know somebody who needs our help? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's an article that explains, you know, a recent group of clients that you've helped. So maybe three short client stories. Does this ring a bell with anybody that you know that needs our help? Another idea that's a little less salesy is we're never too busy to help somebody that you care about. Mm -hmm. It's important when you take financial advisors, like my dad's an advisor and he's in his seventies now, He's busy and he golfs three days a week. And so his clients don't necessarily know that he's growing his business and that he's taking on new clients. So often they have somebody that needs his help, but they're not ready to make that introduction because they think they're bothering him when that can be further from the truth. So it's important to remind clients the number one way that you grow is through referrals, that you are taking on new clients and that you're never too busy to help people that they care about. Your next category here is social media. And and I want to really break this down because checkbox number one here is do you have a professionally optimized and active social media profile and it says on linkedin twitter and then i think it's it's in in twitter for your business what do you mean by that what 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 is your what is indigo marketing agency's definition of a professionally optimized social media profile The channels that we recommend using are LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And so not only do you need your LinkedIn professional profile, but you also need your LinkedIn company page. For Facebook, it's your Facebook business profile. And then for Twitter, we create an account on behalf of your company. There's so many things that you can do to optimize your profiles. In fact, we have a 131 point checklist when we go through and optimize profiles, things like adding a cover image, a headline, the information about your hours and your website and your phone number. And so it's important to fully fill out all of these sections, which we do for our advisors, and then also to have your profiles be active. By that, I mean posting at least three times a week. The reason is not just so more people are seeing you on social media and it's another touch point of your clients and your prospects seeing you, but also it is indicating to search engines that you have a legitimate business that is active and that you are who you say you are and that your business is thriving and your social media profiles are active and that tells search engines, they give you a little bit more credit from an SEO perspective. Do you find that there are specific niches or niches, depending on what area of the country you live in, that work more effectively on any of those big three, or does it matter to you, you're going to hit those three no matter what? Yeah, that's a great question. And so when we see advisors that are working with, you know, women or divorcees or retirees, Facebook is going to be the go-to place. And so we would do, you know, some Facebook work and Facebook ads there. But a lot of the advisors that we work with actually do employer-specific campaigns. So Intel employees, Amazon employees, employees of large hospitals, LinkedIn is really the place to go there because we can target everybody from a specific employer. Tell me a little bit about your Twitter strategy, because I get asked this all the time because Twitter is so quick. It's very, very different from a news feed perspective or a a, a user interface perspective. Are you publishing more frequently in different areas or are all of them going out roughly the same volume? So we always publish three times a week to all of the profiles. Twitter isn't our our core focus. I will say there are some advisors we have that get a lot of traffic to their site from Twitter, but that is not the majority of our advisors. The reason we do Twitter for everyone is from an SEO perspective, but rarely do we see people getting a lot of traffic to their site from Twitter. Usually it's just a, a small trickle. Gotcha. Now, one of the other things in, in social media here in this category is calls to action. So how do you help advisors come up with a call to action that sounds like them, feels like them, but doesn't come across as being pushy? It's important to realize that there should be an appropriate next step, no matter where somebody is in the buying process. They may not be ready to schedule a 30 minute discovery call with you, but maybe they just want to watch a video on their site, or maybe they just want to ask a question, or maybe they're ready to spend a half hour watching your webinar. We want to give them a variety of options, no matter where they are, that feels like a good next step. We offer a 
maybe four step process of different things. They could watch a video, join your newsletter. They could ask a question. They could watch your webinar. They could schedule a call. And at some point as they go through the buying process, they'll take some of those steps. One thing that's missing from your list is podcasting, uh, but you do have video here. I, I definitely want to talk a little bit about video uh, because we, we believe that video is very, very powerful, but we also know that video is not very portable and you have to actually be good behind the camera, which unfortunately a lot of advisors don't have that PR training. Do you help them get more comfortable behind the camera or what happens if they just I mean, for lack of a better description, they suck, right? And they shouldn't be doing video. What do you do in, in, in place of that? Yeah, and so a lot of our advisors are not comfortable on video. And so in that case, we do webinars for them where it's just their voice over the slides. But we really do encourage advisors to do whichever medium they're comfortable with. And podcasting is such a great option. It's, you know, we have several clients in common where they're doing podcasts and we promote their podcasts for them through email and social media. And it's such a great option for them to share their expertise. And obviously most advisors are good at talking to clients. And so it's a perfect fit there because they're comfortable talking, whether or not they have a face for the radio, it's, we can still make it work, but it's a great option. So I just advise people to figure out whatever they are comfortable with. Is it written content? Is it video or is it a podcast? Stick to that and be consistent. How often are you doing the webinars? I, I, you might've said that already, Claire, and I apologize if I didn't write that down. Sure. Yeah. So for most of our advisors, because they're so busy, we create one flagship webinar for their firm for the year. The webinar is typically who we serve and how we help. It goes through the advisor's background, their story, their passion. And then it flips around and talks about the clients. What is the problems keeping them up at night? What have they tried that hasn't worked? What is the emotional benefit that they'll get from working with the advisor? And it ends with an easy call to action. So that flagship webinar is appropriate for anybody who comes to your website. And then many of our advisors follow up that with a more specific specialty webinar, say for doctors or dentists or employees of a certain company. And you said that that was on demand because that's how we were getting their email address. So, okay, that's, that's freaking awesome. So everybody who's listening who are doing webinars, because that's really what's kind of happened here with, with COVID and the pandemic and everything is people have moved quite digital but since they weren't able to do a lot of in-person stuff. Claire just said something there that a lot of you aren't doing, which her system will allow you to do, which is the on-demand. It is so vitally important for you to communicate to your ideal prospects when they are ready and when they have time to meet with you, which might not be Tuesday at seven o'clock. I love that, Claire. That's brilliant. And I'm so glad that you do that. I don't know of anybody else who's really helping advisors execute that that way. So thank you for doing that. That's brilliant. That alone, besides the marketing checklist and the 131 social media profile checklist, all of those other things that Claire has been talking about today, if that didn't get you to hire her, dear God, that one statement right there should have. All right. Last but not least, if you were able to wave a magic wand and get financial advisors to change one thing when it comes to marketing, what would it be? what I would recommend is asking yourself the question, who am I called to serve? And that's something that is at the heart of marketing. When I went to business school and I studied marketing, the core thing that I learned was keeping your fingers on the pulse of your customer. So think about who are you called to serve? Is it business owners? Is it, you know, little old ladies? My dad works with tons of little old ladies and he's always helping them with all of the miscellaneous things that they need. Who do you love working with? What do they need? And that's the heart of your marketing strategy. Often advisors come to me and they say, here's the service I want to offer. I want to do a hedge fund or I want to do this type of investment strategy. Find me clients. I can't do that. What you need to do is think about the people that you want to help and what needs they have. And that will really transform not only your business, but your marketing strategy. And it will also make it so that when you wake up in the morning, you have focus. As, a, as an ex-recovering business consultant in this industry, focus is something that's very difficult. And this, you know, Claire, you've been asked to speak and you speak all over, I know, North America. I don't know if you've spoken all over the world. I probably wouldn't imagine that you haven't. But the idea here is, is you know, ch chasing the next shiny object when it comes to marketing doesn't allow you to focus so that you're going to kind of, in what I jokingly say, half-ass everything instead of full-ass it, right? Which is what we want to do with our marketing program is having major serious focus. We just got a client recently 
who focuses on a health system in a very specific town. Some of his peers were like, you can't do that. And he's like, they've got 40,000 employees, 40,000. Like, I, I couldn't even manage to serve all of those people if I wanted to. He's like, I want 1%, right? I mean, 1% makes his whole career. And when he wakes up in the morning, he's like, this is who I'm talking to. This, And I know that, right? There's an amazing feeling of relief from a marketing perspective when you have great focus. So thank you, Claire, for saying that. That was wonderful. If somebody wants to reach out to hire you, which freaking people should really hire you from this. This is awesome. I learned so much. What is the best way for them to reach out and where should they follow you if they want to learn more? So you can go to our website, indigomarketingagency.com. You can schedule a marketing consulting call where I'll actually go through this checklist with you and make my recommendations to improve your marketing. You can follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter and watch my videos on my site. There's also a webinar on there that is a, a deep dive into what I believe is the truth about marketing for financial advisors that will change the way you think about growing your business and put you in the driver's seat of growing your business in the future. You can also check out my book on Amazon. It's called The Marketing Guide for Financial Advisors advisors. And we will make sure that we have links to all of those things, Claire, in our show notes. Thank you very much for being an absolutely amazing guest. Claire Aiken, founder of Indigo Marketing Agency and a marketing consultant who specializes in working with financial services professionals. Thanks, Claire. Great. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. All right, everybody, if you have not subscribed to the podcast, make sure you click that subscribe now button below. That way, every time we come out with a new podcast, we'll show up directly on your listening device. And surprisingly enough, we just recently interviewed a gentleman who is the CEO of a company called Blueberry that publishes 85,000 podcasts a month. And he said, you know what, Matt, you should put it out there that you guys are looking for a sponsor. So I kind of feel weird about saying that, but you know what? I'm going to say it. So if you guys would like to sponsor our podcast, all you have to do is email me, Matt, at Top Advisor M, or even better, email me at Matt at proudmouth.com, P-R-O-U-D-M-O-U-T-H.com. They both go to me, but uh, I'm supposed to use the new email address. So for everybody at Indigo Marketing and everybody here at Proudmouth, this is Matt Halloran, and we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Thanks for listening to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast brought to you by Proudmouth. If you want to learn more about how to be your own loud podcast, visit our website, read our blog posts, attend educational webinars, and sign up for Influence Accelerator Academy.